Judy, thank you for being here with us today and thank you for doing this. <laughs> yes. Um, it is an absolute joy, um, a privilege, and an honor to speak with you today about disability rights and our past, our present, and our future within the movement. I'm Susan Reynolds, and I'm the field organizer with the National Center for Learning Disabilities. I am a learning disabled adult. I actually have two learning disabilities. Um, one I was not diagnosed with until I was uh, about 15 years old, getting ready to turn 16 right before I think it was probably just a few months before the ADA passed, actually. I was diagnosed with my second learning disability. And I also have ADHD. I'm a mom raising a little boy with multiple disabilities as well. And, um, and today we have Michaela and Julia, and they're actually the, um, two of our members with our Young Adult Leadership Council. And they're really gonna be the ones that will conduct the interview today. I'm just gonna sit back and be quiet and be in absolute awe of you. So um, it's nice to meet you, Judy. And Thank I'm going to hand you. it over to Michaela and Julia. Anyway, I am Michaela Hurst. I am a born and raised New Yorker, but I now live in the beautiful Brattleboro, Vermont. And I'm a graduate of Landmark College. And Landmark is in Vermont near Brattleboro. And that was um, one of the ways I um, found my way back here. I love Vermont. It was the place where I achieved so much success and my life changed for the better because I learned how to learn. I was diagnosed with NBLD and LDNOS when I was 14. I was in the ninth grade and I was uh, struggling in physics and geometry because they're so visual spatial and um, pretty much all my other classes as well. But um, fast forward to today at 26, I have a master's degree in social work. Um, I became an MSW so I could work with all students, LD or visible. And I am also a proud member of the Yelp and community organizer teams with NCLD. And the IDA has awarded me with accommodations and the ability to succeed in all settings with, pun intended, both ears on high alert. And um, Thank you for, and I'm going to say this again, but thank you for all your contributions to the disability community and um, for being one of the pioneers in ensuring that people like me have rights. And I'm Julia. Hi, Julia. I'm also, I'm also a born and raised New Yorker, like Michaela and you as well. Um, and I'm actually two blocks away right now from the school I attended, the Churchill School and Center, which is a K through 12 learning disability school. So this really is what some would say a full circle moment for me, talking to somebody who got us to where we are and enabled the DOE to have schools like Churchill to help kids like us. So it means a lot. Um, I'm currently a development and communications associate at a very small nonprofit um, on the Upper West Side of Manhattan. And really um, because of our movement, I've been awarded so many opportunities to be my best self in the workplace and in school. And even getting my BA at Connecticut College, I was inspired by 504 to take serious action on my campus to say, we need to change our accessibility policies. Because if we can have a diverse black and white population, we can have able-bodied, disabled, and everybody learn here. Your laws and your ability to get people to organize inspires me tremendously, even in my work as an environmentalist too. So it means a lot to speak with you and to hear from you today. So thank you both very much. Thank you, Susan. I, I just want to say that I really always appreciate comments that people make about me. I particularly appreciated what you were just saying, Julia, because I think, you know, the reality is we are learning from each other. And so we sure. are really, um, you know, the reality is I know only so much about learning disabilities. What you were just saying about when you went to college and how you used 504 to make the college um, look at the education of you and other disabled individuals to be able to benefit from education where disability would not be seen as something uh, that would restrict your learning but was a normal part of your life and things that Michaela has been saying. That's what I think is very important. We need to be able to raise all of our voices and really allow people to feel a couple of things because this discussion for me is not just about your individual voices. It's about the fact that you've 
come together to learn from each other. You're using your personal experiences, both the good and the bad, to help not just yourselves, but other people, other disabled people, other non-disabled people. And that's what I'm feeling is so important, is really to continue to tell our stories, you know, your individual stories, what what were the problems? What have you done to make changes? What more needs to be done? How you're working with other people? Because our stories are, on the one hand, our stories. But on the other hand, our stories are always other people's stories, right? We put the individual part of who we are. But it's, it's kind of, I think, scary on the one hand to hear the commonality of the problems we face. But I think it's also really exciting when we can bring those problems to the surface and talk about what we have been able to do to make changes and what more we need to be, what more needs to be done. So thank you all for the work that you are doing. Thank you for all the work that you've done. Thank you. I think thank that we, what? I'm so sorry, I think that just leads so well into our first question um, about the time before we have 504 and the ADA. Um, when did you think you realized that there needed to be protection for people with disabilities like yourself? So um, I would suggest for people in the audience that if you haven't seen the Netflix film Crip Camp, that would be great. And also um, I have a book. <laughs> Let me show you the. Here's a copy of my. It's called Being Human. That is a great play on your last name. Isn't that funny? I love uh, so that. Being Human. It's also on audio. Um, for those people who prefer audio, um, the name of the book is Being Human, an unrepentant memoir of a disability rights activist. It was written by me and a colleague, Kristen Joyner. And the book is read by a woman named Allie Stroker, who is, you know, Allie? Yeah. I, I've watched Allie for years and watching her win a Tony Award a year ago left me in tears and inspired me. Anyway, I asked her to read the book. And so she's the one. You can get it on Amazon or you can get it on um, Barnes and Noble or uh, bookstores in your communities. Um, so in answering your question, you know, what was life like before 504? Um, and, and what made me begin to think that we needed to be um, making changes in, in laws? So it's a great question. And um, I would say I and many of us with disabilities who were really, you know, emerging from being teenagers into young adults, like both of you are, um, we were learning from what else was going on. So at that time, you know, in the 1960s, um, there was the emergence, or I won't say emergence, but clearer visibility of the types of race discrimination that were happening in the United States and the actions that people were taking. So we were, and television played for me a very large role in this. The fact that news now could be seen and we were seeing not only uh, what the barriers were, but we were learning from people about the forms of discrimination and how people in these communities were fighting back against injustice. And, uh, you know, in the 1960s, the 1964 Civil Rights Act, the 1965 Voter, Voters Act, those pieces of legislation, um, the 64 Act did not include disability. And so as we were, as we were coming together and recognizing that what we were experiencing, A, was discrimination, even though others didn't necessarily call it that, we were beginning to learn that word and learn to own that word. We were recognizing that there was something in the United States where 
laws would be passed that would make it illegal to discriminate. And the fact that if discrimination was proved, that actions could be taken to make changes occur. So these were things that we were learning as we were going. And, you know, I didn't know lawyers at that point who were studying civil rights law. Um, but as we, as we began to develop a movement, and I think that's really what we saw emerging more in the late 60s and 70s, something that we could stick the word movement on. It wasn't just individual voices fighting for individual solutions, that we were recognizing we also needed to be more cross-disability. We needed to really understand not only our stories as someone who had polio, but what were the stories of people who had cerebral palsy or muscular dystrophy or epilepsy or whatever other words were being. And you know that learning disabilities came into law um, under the uh, Educational Handicapped Children's Act, but learning disability before 1975 really was only emerging, right? And all the different classifications that you all talk about, those are things that continue to evolve. So I think really learning that discrimination against one adversely affected discrimination, uh, supported discrimination uh, against other people if we weren't fighting against it. So we needed to really look at coming together, looking at what other communities were doing to address issues of discrimination. And, you know, honestly, the other issue is when Title V was included and ultimately uh, passed when President Nixon finally in 1973 signed the Rehabilitation Act as amended, that language, which includes 501, 234, and five, I think, uh, the disability community had very little, if anything, to do with it. It was something that was done by a small group of staffers and senators and congressional members um, recognizing that what had happened in the 60s did not benefit disabled people. And it really wasn't until after President Nixon vetoed the Rehab Act in 1972 that many of us began to look more broadly at what was in the law beyond uh, the Department of Rehabilitation Services. And that's really when we began to educate ourselves. What was this law called Section 504? 40 some words. What did it need to become? And that's when we and I think some very uh, responsive government workers at the federal level began to look at, okay, we've got this um, law which as these 40 some words, but what is disability? What does it mean not to discriminate? Uh, what is a remedy? And so you really see this ramping up of, out of necessity, um, what we need to do to ensure that as these rules are being developed, um, that we can play as strong a role as possible, meaning influencing and on and on. Part of why I end up knowing so much about disability policy is because of experiences that I went through and how I was, I needed to advocate for myself, but that also led me into a place where I'm advocating for others and turning that into a career. But I think, you know, one issue that I'm always concerned about is what is happening to poor and minority families. Um, who don't have access to um, lawyers or other forms of representatives um, or money to be able to get their kids assessed um, or really have a better understanding of, in the area of learning disabilities, all the different types of uh, dis learning disabilities that there, they are, there are. And I think if people understood the stories more clearly um, it would also allow them to be deciphering whether or not their children may or may not have a disability, that may or may not need support under 504 or under IDEA. But I think that's a major issue. And, um, you know, one of the uh, issues within 
the black and brown communities relates to um, overrepresentation of kids in special ed. And for me, my feeling always has been that it's kids being placed in segregated inferior classes where teachers are not able to provide the instruction that kids need. And so they do become a dumping ground. And, and they're not really, they're set up to, you know, not really help ensure that these kids are gonna be getting appropriate educations throughout the course of their school years. And these are things that we need to talk about. These are things that we often don't hear enough of. I, I went to social work school for two years and got my master's and we really didn't talk about these things at all. Yeah, and I think that really is um, there's a lot of racism involved, that we're not looking at issues that really need to be looked at. And clearly, um, issues of overrepresentation in theory of education and the linkage between um, juvenile justice and adult you know, prison systems, the school to prison pipeline, I think you know, it would be really valuable for you all to be looking at, you know, who are these kids? Um, you know, if they were white, what would they be getting? Um, because there is such disproportionate uh, problems. And when you look at the prison system, right? Juvenile, 60 to 70% of these kids have disabilities, the vast majority invisible disabilities, mental health, intellectual disabilities, and I'm sure significant numbers of kids with um, various forms of learning disabilities. It's really just disheartening to see these things and to think about my own experiences. And I admit coming from privilege and having the opportunity and having two parents, my dad's a teacher. So having a father who was an educator who knew the law and knew the signs, because at three years old, I wasn't developing properly and had the money and the power to say to his medical friends, I need help. And that's privilege to acknowledge that and to hear that these stories are continuing on that family, families can't afford doctors and lawyers. It says our system is broken. And to even think about like what we're talking about today that we have our movement and we're still going. And we're that's still still going. evolving. Like I wasn't diagnosed until I was 14. I was diagnosed with a hearing loss um, right before I turned seven and my mom is deaf. So that wasn't totally surprising. But um, I also, like Julia, came from a place of privilege. I grew up in a private school. Um, I had a neuropsychological evaluation. Private was done by um, the best. And um, even though I come from a place of immense privilege, I still fell through the cracks. A student with a learning disability went really understood. And I didn't even understand myself. Right. Only until I got to college. Nor should you be expected to. I think there's a lot of expectations for people like us to know exactly what works for us at all times. And especially now being two years out of college, I'm still trying to figure it out. And people say to me, you've had 24 years to do this. You don't know. And I said, no, because when I was 21, I got a nonverbal learning disability diagnosis. I had no idea what that meant. Well, neither do most people. What does it actually mean? I always joke that if you we walk into a it. room, yeah, you understand 40% of what's going on, not even 40, maybe 30%. And a normal brain, what is normal, will understand 100%, maybe 90, I'll get 30%. And to this day, if somebody tries to hug me, I will not want to hug them. I'm very <laughs> weird about touch and sensory. And little things like my brain's wired differently and even disclosing my learning difference to my boss last week, trying to explain, hey, I'm going to need technology on my computer for word processing so I can make sure I help deliver the best results in this campaign we're going to launch next week. And that says something that 24 years in, I'm still figuring this out. And because of our movement and even my experiences at Churchill School and then Connecticut College, I'm still learning. I go back to Churchill and the parents are marveling. Oh, you've done great things. I said, I'm still going. I'm not done yet until 
I'm going to go to my grave not knowing what works for me until I test out every water possible. Like there's going to be a great software in 10 years for auditory. We're not there yet. It says something. Yeah, I mean, I think also the design of technology and is also influenced by the needs of people, right? So the Quite more true. people can discuss, you know, what your various disabilities, how they um, impact your life, um, people need to understand that designers, as an example, so that when they're designing new software, there are ways that they can, you know, I'm not a designer, but with all the things, you know, that continue to be evolving, uh, understanding um, what barriers people are facing and how technology can uh, potentially be of assistance in helping people on an individual basis be able to address these issues. If you knew everything now, that would mean that there would be nothing evolving. So you would never want to know everything now, um, right? That's exactly right. And I constantly say to them, if I knew everything, what would be the point? Because if we know everything, we're going to get back to a really bad place right. of danger and uncertainty. And, you know, we don't know everything. Sometimes right. we want to know, but we don't need to know. Right. I think all of that sort of leads to my next question. Um, Judy, you were a legislative assistant on the U.S. Senate Committee on Labor and Public Welfare in 1974, and you helped develop the legislation that would go on to become IDA. And what was happening in the U.S. to drive the advocacy and need for the IDA? Because I wasn't around in 1974. Um, what, did that, what did that look like? So... When I started going to school in the 1950s in Brooklyn, um, you know, I was denied the right to go to a regular public school because the principal deemed me a fire hazard. There was a teacher that came to my home two and a half hours a week. That meant that at that point in time, the Board of Ed in New York acknowledged the fact that kids were not being educated and that they needed to do something. The something was clearly not equivalent. And um, the special education classes that I started to go to when I was in the middle of the fourth grade, those were classes that were being set up in New York City as a result of parents primarily who had kids with cerebral palsy because United Cerebral Palsy uh, was really fighting to get kids in school, literally in school. So these kids were going to special classes whether or not they needed additional supports. You know, they could have potentially been in a regular class with some support, um, but these HC classes were set up. So we, um, could you repeat the question again? I got lost, sorry. Absolutely, oh, I know it's kind of long. So what was happening in the US at the time to drive yeah. the advocacy yeah. and need for the IDA? Right, so um, parents were beginning to organize. They were getting clearly an inferior educational system for their kids, but at least kids were not staying home every day. Um, in many cases, keeping them out of institutions um, because they were out of the house during the day. Um, and then I think when I, I was the first kid without cerebral palsy, to go to this HC21 classes in my school. Um, and then my friend, Frida, my late friend, Frida, um, she was the first kid with muscular dystrophy. And we used to kind of joke about how we were integrating the classes for kids with cerebral palsy. But for those of you who have watched the Netflix Crip Camp, um, you'll see that the discussion that occurred around that table, a number of the people there Nancy Rosenblum, Steve Hoffman were friends of mine and we were all going to the same elementary school. Um, and so what my mother and other mothers were learning at that time when we were in elementary school was if you used a wheelchair or had a mobility disability, you went back onto home instruction. 
so my mother and other mothers really fought to get that changed. And uh, that's when the Board of Ed made high school, some high schools um, accessible. And there were some newer schools that were being built. So they were already complying with New York state laws on accessibility, which were very heavily influenced by disabled veterans who had come back from the Second World War. All these, it's, all these pieces are really historically very interesting. So we, um, we really were moving as we were learning. And uh, that ability to continue to kind of change as things were moving forward was very important. And it also really enabled those of us with disabilities ourselves as we were getting older to recognize that we really had to play a more prominent role in what was happening. And I think, you know, generationally it happens, you know, when uh, we move from one generation to another. My generation was also, as I said earlier, being very influenced by uh, the civil rights movement, by the women's movement, by the anti-war movement. We were really being influenced by speaking up and speaking out. Right. And I think that was all very important. Thank you. Now also, um, leading into that, as a lifelong civil rights advocate for people with disabilities, what is the most significant positive change you've seen within the disability rights movement? For me, the positive change that I've seen, there's so many. Um, Obviously, the ability of voices to come together to get laws passed, to get regulations developed, to deal with enforcement, to get people in the community who have protections to learn about what these laws say, how they can impact their lives. Um, the expansion of our movement, so they were moving away from being uh, so stovepiped. Um, and I think that's very important. The recognition that our movement, not only in becoming uh, cross disability, also is expanding to be a, a racially diverse community where um, we recognize that all of us need to be a part of the solutions and that, you know, every individual person, but also communities experience different things and having people from those communities be able to work with people within communities can also be very beneficial. You know, as I'm a Jewish person and, you oh, know, for me, so, you know, for me, um, I'm, I'm not uh, Orthodox. And if you're going to be dealing with families who have kids with disabilities, and they may be orthodox, uh, they may have certain ways that they're gonna do things that are not typical. So being able to understand what some of the cultural issues are in different communities is very important, which is why I think diversity is so really important. We have to reflect the people we represent. Otherwise, we're not really representing people and their voices are not able to come forward as they uh, must come forward where people can feel empowered. I think other positive changes are, as our movement evolves, we are beginning to slowly have an impact on other movements. So while I believe that our movement is becoming a more diverse movement, I don't believe that other movements are really integrating disability yet as they need to be. Um, because like if the women's movement really integrated disabled women into their movement, it would have a very powerful impact. So if we look, for example, at the women's movement that looks at issues around violence against women. So we know that disabled women are disproportionately experiencing violence compared to non-disabled women. And we know that non-disabled women who experience sexual assault are likely to acquire some form of a disability. Um, 
but if the women's movement itself doesn't get it, then they are not appropriately representing women who in fact are experiencing these barriers, these forms of discrimination. So I think, um, you know, in looking uh, day by day moving forward, we need to be ensuring that we are not only expanding our movement, but that we're really strongly influencing other movements so that they understand why they need to be expanding what they're doing to be inclusive of disabled people. Just thinking about our next question, I was really mesmerized when you were talking about television being this medium and getting the movement out there. And right now we're kind of in that age of fast media with social media and everything happening online, even watching a democratic convention on a live stream last night. Can you speak a little bit about how the movement will go forward in this age of technology and social media and even cancel culture? So honestly, what's your answer to that question? I guess my exact question is, is like, how do we organize now if we can't have marches and ma and, ma and I can't figure the word right now, but like big gatherings, we've been told social distance, no gatherings, more than like five people. Where do we go if we can't well, protest? I mean, the reason I was asking you what your answer to that question is, the social media is something that you're all growing up with. Um, you're learning it. Um, I'm struggling learning it. Um, there are all these new things that are coming out regularly, and I haven't caught up with what was put out yesterday. So I'll, I'll answer part of that question. Um, but then both of you, I think it would be great for you to give your input. Um, I guess for me, in some way, even knowing, you know, people talk about how social media is exploding and giving disabled people opportunities to talk and meet other people in a way pre-COVID didn't occur. So for me, as someone who's older, I want to know more about that and how to access it. Because honestly, I'm not great at it. I have, I work with, you know, two younger people who are obviously way more knowledgeable than I am. But I think it's important um, that intergenerationally we understand the different forms of social media, not only to learn, but also to put things up and out. Um, I think as far as the ability to gather, I am sincerely hoping that we are on pause, not that we are going to go to a place where demonstrations will no longer occur. And I think what we are seeing with Black Lives Matter as an example is that there really was somewhat of a pause because the numbers of people that um, would likely have come out, including people like myself, because of my age and my disability, I didn't go to any of the demonstrations, but I did uh, use social media to uh, express my views. So I think we're really needing, we're living in a completely undefined period of time um, where we really don't exactly know what's next. But I do think that one of the principles we're operating under is we talk about 61 million disabled people in the US. We do not see anywhere near that number of people um, expressing themselves using various forms of social media and others. So we're needing to be able to reach out to people to help them see the value of their stories helping people to create their stories and helping people to learn how to put them forward and how we use social media in a way, um, not as a substitute to, but as a, a, new, a new tool. Um, and that when things open up more and we can go back to having demonstrations, it's not an either or. And I think we've been seeing this even before COVID that as social media was coming forward, that we were using social media and demonstrations together. What are some of your thoughts? I 
think in general, social media for me is good and bad. I make a living promoting nonprofits on social media. And I think because of that, I've backslated my activism online. But I guess in recent weeks, I've become more vocal um, because we are in the midst of finding our next cohort for our Young Adult Leadership Council. And we work together to make films about why you should join National Center for Learning Disabilities Efforts. And we were encouraged to share them. And when I put my information out there, I was so nervous. I didn't have the best experience my first job disclosing. And I thought, if I'm going to disclose online, it's just going to be a repeat of the past. I was wrong. I got a ton of love. And a lot of people asking me questions like, how come I didn't know National Center for Learning Disabilities was a thing? And that was huge for me to get that love and acceptance and more people wanted to learn more about my work and just the opportunities I've been awarded through this organization and this group of people that has made existence to advocate for the one in five. So it really just came from love. And I think we all could use more love right now. And yeah. just seeing that love and acceptance made me feel a lot better. And even so forth, like being able to give myself like a pat on the back or even get a hug from my mom, that was a huge deal. Yeah. And I think, quote unquote, seeing the love, but feeling the love. Yeah, you feel it in really strange ways. And I'd like to think I like online love more than I like real hugs but I'll get there one day. Exactly. When it's appropriate for you. Exactly. And when you say that, that means so much to me. Thank you. Yeah. Michaela, I do you have any use, thoughts? Yeah, I use social media a lot for um, my community organizing work. And I also, um, I blog for an organization called the NBLD Project. What is it? It's called the NVLD Project. I can send you more information. What is um, NVLD? But I blog for, yeah, I blog for them. Um, what, is, what is NVLD? Um, Nonverbal Learning Disability, or some people call it NLD. Um, with me, it mostly impacts my visual spatial awareness, my depth perception. My visual memory is pretty poor. Um, I used to have issues when I was younger with um, social interaction. And I don't really like admitting that as an adult because um, I'd grown out of it and I really just needed to like find the right people. But uh, those are those are my struggles. And I blog for the NBLD project to share them. And I've gotten messages from people everywhere um, thanking me or wanting advice. Um, I blog for Understood. I blog for an organization called Friends of Quinn. And now I work on Yelp. So I, um, I've spent a lot of time on social media over the past a couple of years uh, promoting my, uh, my brand, the disabilities brand, the LD brand. Um, and as like terrible as this time has been for <laughs> like pretty much everyone, um, I also realized more than ever the impact that social media has and how much I've done just sitting in an office at home. Um, for example, like I got to interview Judy Human from from home. I participated in Hill Day, which is where we talked to um, representatives and senators. Again, all from my office, and um, I'm really realizing the value of that more than ever. And that's something that we can continue to use to advocate for ourselves and to make a change. And then someday, when it's appropriate again, and um, we can all go out and um, do the the kind of old fashioned um, change making that we were doing before rallies and protests and say all of those things when it's appropriate again to do that. Then we can I, actually, that. I actually, um, you know, you called it old fashioned. So um, what I in part worry about is either or. I mean, I think what we're doing virtually is very important. And I certainly agree with you that, you know, my book coming out this year, the video coming, you know, Crip Cam coming out this year, I was supposed to be doing like a tour starting in February, which obviously has been canceled, but doing things virtually, I'm actually able to do uh, 
talk to a lot more people. On the other hand, for me, um, I really like being able to meet people. You know, this is great because there's two of us. Um, is there an audience watching us today? This is being recorded to be shared with um, our community at National Center for Learning Disability. Okay. So, you know, when I've done events that have like a thousand people on them and I only, only see it as a number and it's great, you know, that I've been able to talk to a thousand people. But for me, I also like to be talking to people, you know, just one-on-one. -on -one. So, um, and you know, you could tell if you've been watching the DNC convention or next week, the Republican convention, when people are not there and you're sitting in front of the camera talking to millions of people, it's a different delivery. It's great that they've been able to do this. But I really do hope that when this gets more under control and it's safe for us to go out, that we don't see the demonstrations and stuff is old fashioned, but that we're creating something which is a combination of um, activities in the street and much more advanced social media. And I mean, one of the issues I think guys too, with social media that we need to be conscious of are communities where internet connectivity doesn't really exist or where people don't have the numbers of computers that they need in their home, their laptops, and how kids are not benefiting from education, not just because they're not in school, but because they may not have the right technology or they have it and nobody knows how to use it or they don't have the, you know, the connectivity. So um, I think for me, it's really drilling down on the advancements and then also what we need to do to ensure that these advancements don't cut out large numbers of people. No, these are all things that we need to consider. And old fashioned definitely is not the right word. I'm not being critical, but I, I just- No, I know. No, I'm just being- um, Definitely critical. not the right word, but when I say that in my head, I'm like, the things that we've always done that have initiated change. Yes. And the things that I also love to be doing that like, I wish I could be doing, but COVID is a thing. Exactly. And also, I also like doing things We've always done them. I always say, like, I like to write things down. I don't depend on my phone for everything, that sort of thing. And um, you said about um, accessibility and internet connectivity. Um, I teach Hebrew school on the weekends, and we had to um, move everything to Zoom. And I had one student who always had issues with his internet and his microphone, and it was, you know, it was really frustrating to see that. Yeah, not be able to really help. And this time yeah. has posed all sorts of challenges for people with disabilities. Yep. Just even thinking about this idea that 504 and IDEA and the ADA are not always absolutes. And even so forth, we're still, like my parents had to sue the DOE every year to inform my school funding. And I'm still fighting for accommodations in the workplace sometimes. Can you um, perhaps give us a piece of advice for young adults and advocates who are still advocating and fighting for their rights? That's not going to change. And it's not just young people. I think, you know. Perhaps even um, all people? Yeah. I mean, I think, you know, but all three of us had our disabilities when we were younger. You benefited from 504 or IDEA or both. I didn't because there was nothing there. So I think uh, what we need to recognize is a there we always need to be as knowledgeable as possible about what our rights are. Um, I think we also need to be demanding more go on with our universities and teacher training. Definitely. Um, so it's not only teacher training for people moving into the field, but really looking at what we need to do to train those teachers who are in the field and need more instruction to be able to understand how to effectively work with kids who have different ways of learning and administrators and school board members. 
people really need to understand, in my mind, not just what the law says, but I really do think it's important for people to understand how people with different kinds of disabilities, the kinds of adjustments, accommodations that may need to be provided in order to enable one or more kids to benefit you know, from learning. Also, I think we need to recognize, as both of you, I think, have said, is people may be identified with having their disabilities as they're older. So, you know, you may, like I have a friend who was identified as having a learning disability when she was in her master's degree program, which is not atypical, right? Not at all. Not and at that's all. because people don't understand what they're looking for, which is why I was saying earlier on, we really, in my view, these labels don't mean anything. You know, you tell the average person on the street, I have X, Y, Z. That's like, great, what the hell does that mean? So really explaining and allowing people to understand what it is we're talking about, um, what are ways that we can um, adapt to, get supports for. If people don't understand what something means, they're, they're going to shut off or they're gonna turn away. And it doesn't mean that everybody who knows will do the right thing, but I really do believe that moving away from labels that are alphabets that really don't mean anything to most people, um, and surprisingly to many people who have those labels, they don't necessarily understand what it means either. So I think the ability to really articulate, explain what it is that we're discussing um, so that people who may, in this case, have various forms of learning disabilities, um, have a way of saying, oh, these things sound very much like me. These are things that I'm having difficulty with. What is it that I may need um, that I never thought of because I never realized that there are a lot of other people out there or not so many people out there who have something similar. And I think, you know, when you look at what you're doing, you know, you're doing it for younger people, which is great. I think we also need to look at how we become advocates, how we get other people of different ages um, to be involved in learning how to advocate, learning what their rights are, and learning how to advocate on their own behalf and with others. And that um, really answered uh, my last question, which is um, what work still needs to be done on the part of both people who identify as having a disability and also allies to the disability community? So I think, um, one, we need to allow people to understand what dis the breadth of disability. You know, when you just look at learning disabilities and the number of labels you've ticked off for the two of you, um, and then so many other types of disabilities that are not learning disabilities, you know, depression, anxiety, bipolar, lupus, um, whatever, deafness, art of hearing, blindness, low vision. Um, people need to understand that these, what our definitions of disability are, the kinds of discrimination that are protected and that people not only have a right, but are encouraged to be able to speak up and out about who they are. And that our movement itself needs to continue to grow. I can't thank you enough for taking the time to be with us today. I actually have your book and I'm so sad you couldn't do the tour this year because I was going to bring my son to see you um, because, well, he calls you Miss Judy in our home. Um, uh. <laughs> He's, he just turned 10. So he's like, Oh, Miss Judy, she wrote a book. I'm like, yes, she did. And so I was very sad that we couldn't come and see you and, and uh, have you know, get your autograph, get your signature in, in your book. Um, but, it, you know, we'll make that happen eventually. And I love hearing, I loved, I don't know, ladies, how you feel about, I loved hearing about the history of the, our movement, because I think we have to look at that history to see where we've come from. And I really want to say, I think it is really important that um, you get your stories out there, the evolution of your portion of the movement. So people understand how it started, why it started, how it's been developing. I think, you know, 
we're one movement, but it is really important to learn about different aspects of what different parts of the movement started out doing, why they started out, what they're doing, and where they want to go. And that allows other people to also be able to advocate with you on your issues. It does. It really does. And I like to, um, I like to say to this, because my son, I, he's growing up with ADA. He's growing up with IDEA. He's growing up with 504. This is, he's 10. This is not anything he doesn't know. And he, his classroom last year was an inclusion classroom. And when he came home from his first day of school, he said, mom, there were other kids just like me. They have disabilities too. And he said at nine, he said, I didn't feel so lonely all of a sudden. And I thought that's, isn't that what we're working for? Yes. Exactly. 